Good evening and welcome to Creative Conversations. My guest tonight is Davey Holmes, who's a WGA award-winning screenplay writer. He's developed numerous pilots for Showtime, FX, and Fox. He was the creator and showrunner of the hit epics TV series, Get Shorty, and the executive producer of Shameless on Showtime, as well as producing and writing on Pushing Daisies, In Treatment, and Damages. And uh, I've been very privileged to work with him once and uh, call him a pal. So here's Davey. Welcome. Hello. How you doing? Good, man. Good to see you. You gave me a heart attack. I'm sorry. I, I thought <laughs> it was kind of close. <laughs> I, I've been doing a lot of Zoom pitches, and I've gotten uh, a little bit cocky about being able to set up a, a video conferencing thing. But... I've forgotten. We decided to switch the camera and computer the other day. Ah, that's right. And uh, I couldn't make it work. So anyway, here it's, it seems to be working. So it's okay. We're uh, you're you're freezing up occasionally, but that's okay. You know. Oh, no, oh, sorry. Yeah. It's all right. You're not on camera talent, so it doesn't matter. You know. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're, <laughs> you're behind the lens, so uh, it's all. I set up some projects. Uh, with really miserable AV skills and terrible performing skills. So, you know, it's good to have a job that doesn't require you to be competent in those areas. Right, right. But you, uh, you know, you're the first person I've had on the show who I would call, you know, th there's all this talk about triple threats, but you write, produce, direct, and show run. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap, in, especially where the showrunner uh title right. writing and producing in tv is yeah is mandatory sort of for sure i spend running. a lot of time explaining to my friends what a sh they say what is a showrunner i never see that cr that in the credits yeah it's I, I i think john wells might have coined the phrase i'm not sure but it didn't exist 15 years ago that term or 20 years ago and uh is because there's all these different flavors of producer on a TV show, you know, from people who are actually producing uh, hands on uh, on set all day to people who are producers in name only. They're just writers who've been elevated to a certain level to people who are show running and making lots of decisions. And you don't really know who's the boss necessarily if you just come into that world. And so I think John Wells or somebody came up with this phrase, which means I'm the boss. Uh, everyone else reports to me. Showrunner, but it's not. It's not really a, a title you'd see in a credit. Right. Um, yeah, I know who the boss is. It's the it's the person writing my check. Even that's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> it's entertainment right. partners. I do whatever they tell me to do. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Some weird corporation somewhere that that magical check comes from. Right. So, you know, one of the things I like to ask people is I, I, I like to find out what their origin story is. You know, how, how they ended up. Uh, well, well, we'll get to how you ended up where you are. But what I, what I like to find out is, you know, I know very clearly exactly where I was and how old I was when I said this is something I want to do. Now, is the path that you're on now something that you thought of when, you know, obviously you didn't say, I want to be a showrunner, writer, producer. But when you were a kid, was was this something you had in mind, being in film, television, the performing arts? Yeah, I, I didn't have anybody around who knew how it worked. You know, I didn't, I was... Me didn't neither. Have any show, no, I know. It's terrible. It was sad. Um, no, I didn't really know anything about it. No one around me did, but I knew I kind of wanted to be Charlie Chaplin or whoever was I had a crush on at that moment. Um, and I think my mother put it in my head that being a writer was a good thing. But it took me to my mid-20s to cycle around to the idea of actually doing that stuff and trying to figure out literally by going to buy how-to books in the beginning, how to format a script and how you write a script and how all that works. I, I was a writing major in college, but um, again, it really wasn't until my mid-20s that I got focused on dramatic writing. 
Right. Okay. Uh, where did you, did you go eventually go back to school for dramatic writing or any screenplay? I just read, started with plays. I read a million plays and I started as a playwright in New York. I mean, I was writing pilots, terrible pilots and terrible screenplays as well while I was bartending in New York and living in an eight, a 200 foot square apartment with eight foot ceilings uh, for, for some years, for three years there. And, uh, and then my big break was a play uh, that I wrote that got traction and, and I came out to LA after that and it still took me another year or two to get a TV job. And my first job was on Law and Order, which nobody saw coming, but this wonderful playwright who was running, running Law and Order, Eric Overmeyer, right. gave me a job based on, on a play, ignoring all of my terrible TV work, which probably we didn't even submit. And so I, I started learning kind of on the job. What years were you on Law and Order? It was the 16th season of The Mothership. Okay. I don't know what year that would make that. Uh, no idea. You know, long time ago. Right. And, okay, so you so you found your way into this. It was what you wanted to do. Um, when you write... Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talk about, um, I mean, I know television writing has to be very structured. When you're writing your own stuff, say a play, not for television, but a screenplay, or do you write any fiction? I don't. I, I really just focused on, you know, TV writing for 20 years. You know, it's, it's even, I'm starting to get into some feature writing, uh, and it's been a long time since I tried to play. I compose a Twitter a tweet. No. Right. Okay. Because one of the questions I ask people is, you know, pants or process? Um, but I suppose in television, you have to be very process oriented. What's the pants side of it? How does that work? Pants is I'm going to sit down and see where this leads me, as opposed to really having uh, a structure that you're starting with. Particularly, uh, you know, for instance, I, I would imagine when you're, when you're breaking a season, you have to have your your A, B, and C storylines. You've got to have your e e each episode really broken down. I mean, on one hand, you know, I wrote so much stuff that didn't know where it was going all those years when I was trying to figure this out. I would write a draft of something and start rewriting it without even rereading the draft. And then they would just stack up because I knew, I just knew I didn't have it yet. I hadn't figured it out. And they would just stack up because I didn't know where I was going. And, and I also was really, I really got into it because I loved rhythm. I, I loved the sort of music of words, but I had no interest and therefore no feel at all for story. I really had no sense of how to tell a story, which is really important. And I was uh, really pulled in by Sam Shepard and by Harold Pinter and by these sort of obscure works of theirs. Uh, and so my early plays, somebody said, I don't really understand it. And I would say, exactly. <laughs> but that's a problem moving forward, moving, moving out of, you know, your college dorm or whatever you're doing with that the material I had at that point. It's... Uh, you, you need to actually be able to communicate something and tell a story. And I found that writers who were, I thought, uh, less serious than I thought I was, were able to knock out better stories than I could in days. Uh, so, so in a way, I had to go to school, not literally, but teach myself to tell stories. And that really does start to mean that you, you think it through ahead of time. There's all plenty of room for discovery. You, when you flesh it out, there's so much discovery. Every moment to really live it is a process. You know, you know, as an actor, you have to actually go in and live it. It's, it's, I find it uncomfortable, but it's really where the exciting stuff happens. But uh, to have some sense of what you're trying to communicate overall, even if it's just what the tone of it is or the 
or the takeaway is. Uh, I, I find that, you know, essential. The flip side is in television, there are, there's this sort of committee of executives and studio and network and, and other writers and directors and cast, all these other folks you're collaborating with. And by the time you've convinced them all that you know what you're doing, meaning you've submitted an outline and revised an outline and pitched it, gone into rooms and done a song and dance, it can start to feel like you're sucking the life out of it before you've even written the thing. And I know some writers who are protective of that, the, the same way that actors can be. Some actors, you know, want to discuss the thing a certain amount, but no more, because you're going to start, they're going to start overthinking or robbing the process of the yeah. thing vital. Um, so that's a tricky balance, because yeah, I outline everything to death. I am right now on a project, just. So uh, you, you said something that I really uh, want to tap into. You know, you talked about um, being stuck. What do you do when you're stuck? I know, I know as an actor and I know, I know as an actor and a writer, what I do when I'm stuck, when I don't have any idea what to do. But what do you do? I, I don't, I don't find that I'm stuck that way. It's, it's all arduous for me. The process is rarely easy and I show up and I'm obsessive. So I'll sit in this chair here all the time and either get a lot done or get very little done. I tend not to know whether I'm on a roll until the day's over and I look back on what I've done and I'm often appalled at how little I've done. Um, but I, I don't feel stuck as much as maybe some self-flagellation for not buckling down hard enough. Huh. But it's a series of questions. So if I'm focused enough, I'm saying, what is the story? I'm saying to myself, sometimes I'm saying it out loud to, to somebody I work with. I have an assistant who in COVID times, it's virtual, but, but often you know sits across from me and forces me to say out loud, okay, the point of this scene is this. And so I think this and this happens, but the question is right now, what does this person want? And why are they doing this thing? And maybe they shouldn't be doing that because it doesn't really track. Does it track? If you start asking the questions out loud, then maybe you get to a point where it's, all right, so what are 10 ideas for answering that? Uh, well, he doesn't, he doesn't like her very much, so he's misleading her. Or maybe he does like her and he's blah, 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 blah. You come up with 10 answers and one of them might jump out as, let's go with that for now. Right. That's, so that's, there's no stuck other than maybe looking back at the work and thinking, hmm, it's not good yet. So I won't get a good night's sleep, but I hopefully can come back in and voice what the – what, what the problem seems to be and look for solutions. I love what you said about tapping into what the character wants because I, I spend so much time with my students looking at screenplays where something's happening because they want it to happen and they haven't figured out how, yet how to connect that to, to a need or desire of the character. Yes. Um, and the, the fact that you want this wonderful, interesting chase or explosion or love scene to happen isn't a good enough reason for it to happen. It, it's not <laughs> worth asking, honestly, stress testing that is a phrase a colleague of mine uses. Really asking yourself if, you, if it makes any sense in an emotional way to your character. But... There are a lot of ways to get there. So if it's something you really think you're hanging a lot of, uh, of import on or that the drama of what you're doing, the story, the story is dependent on this. If you work hard enough, you can often come up 
with a very interesting, very specific reason that tracks for the character. It may make some other things change. It may, it may change who the person is in your mind. But you can often get there. And I, uh, that's how I feel when I see something on TV that I think doesn't, doesn't work, doesn't actually make sense. I never think, oh, you should have cut that plot twist. I won't say never. But I often just think, oh, you just had to work harder there to, to earn that. So um, I, I want to get back to some of the stuff about shows in a little while. Uh, you know the uh, the experiences you've had working on particular shows and how you how you uh, run your season. But I want to step into a different world for a minute because I have so many. Uh, I have two sets of students. I have my screenwriting and production students at Chapman, and then I have my acting students. So. You have a director casting hat on sometimes as a producer. And one of the things now that, you know, actors are really having to deal with is, and they have a lot of questions about, are the self tapes. So do you spend time watching those? Yes, and, um, I do. And, and, you know, we're so on the go once production starts that we cast almost everything at that point. From a self tape. From now, a self tape. Now, when I was on other shows, other people's shows coming up, um, if they del if the showrunner delegated to whatever whoever whatever writer wrote that episode, the duties of casting. I was in a lot of live casting, but for the last bunch of years, it's almost entirely self tape. Okay. And I do count on the casting director and on the director to give me choices, meaning they've already called a whole bunch of folks out of the running before it gets to me. Right. And that's a little awkward. I'll, I'll find out I knew somebody who was submitted and I never knew they were submitted because it didn't get to me. So I, I couldn't even give them feedback on in any way. Um, but I certainly do watch and, and if somebody, if I'm in a rush, uh, a director might really strongly recommend one or two people. I might only really look at their choices. Um, and if I don't like them, then I start really digging around. Uh, or if I think, well, let's just look at the options of who this person could be. That Those, those people are great, but let's look. At, then I might, I might watch a couple dozen tapes for, for a role. Okay, that's what I have a question about. When you're watching, say, uh, 24 people, let's say, 12, yeah. 24 people. Do you have this experience of that somebody says, for instance, um, they slate. Hi, uh, Matthew Arkin, I'm reading for, and then you hit the fast forward because the moment you look at this person, it, it has nothing to do with whether or not they're any good. They're just clearly not the guy. Because I uh, and I'm asking that because I sat with my dad once watching him watch a casting, uh, watch a tape, and I was you know in the process of auditioning a lot at the time, and uh, people would get their name at out and he'd fast forward, and it freaked me out. <laughs> I mean, look, on one hand, yes, it's a terrible process. Uh, I tell I tell actors, you know. If you lose a role for some for a reason that stupid, right? It's like, oh, it didn't get either either the directive hadn't occurred to us or it didn't get communicated that you can't have blonde hair because you're going to be opposite someone with blonde hair, something right. like that dumb. Then you will get a job for a reason that dumb. You know what I mean? Or to, just for or or to to, to make it less uh, pejorative, to you'll get a job for a reason because specifically you are who you are and right. That's, that's right for something. Um, but I tend to watch, uh, you know, if not all of an audition, a good chunk of it, because a lot of times I'm, tr I'm still trying on who the character might be as well as learning who the actor is. And one thing I, you know, I, I'm proud of on get shorty is we did a fairly good job of, of holding on to tapes or names of actors who were great 
sometimes for very small roles, actors who submitted themselves for very small roles, if they were great, something about them was fantastic, really unique in a certain way, or they just had clearly had chops, um, they were willing to do a part that wasn't a big part, but, but they clearly were really talented, we would hold on to those names and pull them in because they're valuable to us. Those actors are really valuable and we cast a bunch of parts. So you know, the casting director and I, Rachel Tenner, we would come back to that list of names. What about that girl who blah, 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 blah. We'd even write for them. I'd even be in the room and we would have some little bit thing for some day players uh, or a big thing for day players. Who can we lean? Oh gosh, you know, are we going to get someone who can hold, carry a scene? We go back and think, Oh, this guy who auditioned for that role two episodes ago was great. Let's write it for him. And there's nothing more fun than that actor getting an offer. You know, they thought they didn't. They thought they didn't get this little part. They, they auditioned for a little role six weeks ago. And they never thought about it again, and they get an offer for a part that's six times bigger or recurring because they were great, but they weren't right for that role. Yeah. And there is nothing better than that for an actor. When you just get a call and say, hey, they want you for this. And you, yeah. you say, I didn't audition for that. I mean, the heartbreaking thing is how often, you know, when I, when I would sit on live auditions, how often I would want to run after an actor and say, you are fantastic. You're not going to get this part because of some reason. You're not, you're not who is going to tell the story for us. But you're, you are, you did, not only are you great, but you were great in that audition. And you know, I'd say it to the casting director, you just know it's probably not going to get back to them. And that if they are professional, they're going to take their self-worth with them and hopefully not need that validation. But it is, it is hard knowing that they don't get it. Well, I'm so glad to hear you say, you know, say this so clearly, because what I'm telling my students all the time is book the room, don't book the job. Yeah. If you go back to a casting director a second time, that should answer all of your questions. Yes. You, whether or not you get that particular job has to do with too many factors that are in Davy's head, too many boxes that have to be checked that are completely outside of your control. And, and, it, and it, is a, it is who you are. Um, you know, we're, we're looking to, to tell that story and, and it, it's, it goes beyond, it's, it's very hard to, to explain, but it certainly isn't your chops, your talent, or even just your look. It's who you are. We're peopling this world of very specific people, direction. You know, I remember uh, when, I, when I came into the table read for episodes, I think it was nine and 10 in yeah. season two. Yeah. I uh, I think I, I I thought I came close to getting fired right there at the table read. I don't I don't know if you remember what happened. <laughs> no. Um, it was the scene. Um, I actually, uh, because of my own ego, have the clip. But it was the scene, um, the Hedda scene, where yeah. he was directing us, and uh, and and I had not even met Ray. And I was sitting all the way across the table. It was this huge table somewhere, you know, 60 people around a table. And I was all the way on the other side of the table. And in the middle of that scene, I don't know if you remember, but he interrupts us and stops us to give us notes. And, uh, and he, gives, he gives us notes. And, uh, and then when he's done, he says, okay, let's, let's take it from uh, your line, Clive. Uh, I'm sorry, Hedda. And, you know, he's got that voice. So he says, you know, take it from, uh, I'm sorry, Hedda. And I said, I'm sorry, Hedda. And he looked up at me from his script and then looked over at Adam and said, oh, okay, I see. I see how it's going to be. And Adam looked over at me like, you got some balls to be he, he he's and he's also clocking. He's like, this is so we're in the family here. I yeah. He's like, okay, I got two of you now giving me a hard time. This is fantastic. He uh, 
you know, you can't be Ray without fending off imitations of Ray Romano. That's, yeah. that's just part of his life. Uh, but we would all buy our terrible, our terrible Rays to Ray. You, you guys, uh, but you guys ran a great set on that show. I mean, I'm I'm really proud of what your brother Adam pulled off. Uh, I think uh, he taught me a lot about. I mean, you know, one one thing he says is having a no asshole policy, which means that you're you're really weighing um, not only the credits of the people that come aboard, but also you know whether you get a sense that they are people that you want to be around and that are respectful to the to the people they work with in this business admittedly we will accept some personality disorder in exchange for talent that's just a, that's a truth about how it works but it is possible to um cultivate a a, a culture and a feeling on set that it's not clicky that we're not all backstabbing that you're not going to get ahead by making other people look bad um and that we're supportive and that we're going to have a good time if possible and that if you can marry that with good work uh then that's a place you want to go every day i mean it's just a great it's a great thing to strive for and it seems so obvious but it's crazy how how uh it's not often a conscious priority and everyone's nervous. There's a lot of money at stake. I, was this your question? I hope I didn't mishear your question. Well, you're, no, you're doing great. Yeah. But there's a lot at stake, and it, it can bring out the worst in people, you know, and and people get defensive, and everybody's very vulnerable. People are having to sort of put themselves on the line. It's good to have a it conscious in the front of your mind that we want to support each other. We want to support each other, and that doesn't mean you don't get a, you know, someone won't talk to you if you, if you're making life harder for other people, or that if you're not doing great work, someone won't try and help you and then relieve you of your command. But along the road, we really try and get each, have each other's backs. Well, you had that uh, that that feeling was palpable on the set constantly. Um, it was really it was just it was a comfortable place to to work, uh, yeah. and also just an incredibly generous group of people. Uh, Eric Tignini and and uh, Attila uh, have both come. Uh, Attila was on the show. Attila came and spoke to my students. Uh, Eric came and spoke to my students. And, uh, you know, just guys who are willing to, to give back and really uh, create that atmosphere. So it goes uh, it goes a long way. Uh, on the converse, do you have a, uh, a life's too short list? Do people oh, get sure. <laughs> Not I'm not going to ask you about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of crazy people who are in the business and there's a lot of, I mean, a, a lot of talented, but completely miserable humans. I mean, of course, um, I mean, I probably, I'm probably on some of those lists for other people. I've had moments where I didn't fit with what I was, you know, with a group of people. Um, but yeah, you, you, uh, that's easy. When, when someone's on that list, you know, you, you just know, don't, don't do that again. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So um, you were talking about um, the race to the end of the season uh, and, and what you just, uh, you talked about, uh, particularly in season two, finding, um, finding the ending in the editing room or something. Yes, well, all the all the seasons, and it always fell to your brother. It always fell to Adam to do. We we shot in blocks, so you get a whole you get a whole block. You get you get two episodes. You get two hours, a features worth of material, to do, and you know you you learn as a TV writer coming up. People are always stressing. You know, have the scripts done ahead of time. You want it done before prep, because every day that you cut into prep means. Everything gets more expensive and people can't, the directors aren't being able to, 
you know, fully envision what they're trying to do. Uh, the actors aren't, it's hard for them to be off book, et cetera. It just screws with everybody's process. You clearly haven't worked with Glenn Gordon, Karen. <laughs> I, I haven't, but every show I've ever been on, John Wells sometimes pulls off an amazing ability to get the work done on time. But every show I've been on other than with John, by the time you get to the end of the season, you're, if, if you're, if you're, if it's only the last block that you're behind, Honestly, you're doing pretty well. If you've got those scripts in good shape before prep, before the last block, I say good on you. But personally, when we get to those last episodes, Adam was a good sport, but I would just routinely be telling him, you know, I'd say, oh, it's great. It's all under control. It's going to be great. So uh, he'd, he'd be out scouting. And I'd say, well, there's, a, you know, I'll, I'll send you a list of, of locations with a with a, a sentence about what I think happens in the forest. Uh, we need a shack in the forest. It's really simple. And we need, you know, and he was such a good sport about it and pulled off some miraculously great material while being handed pages, you know, just just going into the shoot. Um, I I'm really, I love, I was just watching, uh, re-watching some of the stuff you were in at the, in the prison in season two, right? That's season two. Right. Uh, I love that whole through line. We had this running gag where we were juxtaposing, you know, uh, Chris O'Dowd is, his Miles has gone to prison and he's gone to a maximum security, really scary prison. And Romano's character, Rick, has gone to a super cushy prison. And so we're having fun cutting back and forth between the two. And and I I just rewatched the scene where you greet Ray with whatever you know you you're offering him cookies that your kid made and and you guys have separate little bunks that are all made and and you put in you put in earbuds and and it's all so cozy. <laughs> yeah. At one point we we cut between this is Adam's episode he directed between. Someone getting shivved, a character getting shivved, and it's this really gripping, beautifully directed, traumatic uh, scene in that one storyline. To you guys playing badminton uh, in the in the minimum security prison, and and the idea was just to keep, just to go right from that to to the black to hearing doink, 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 and then cutting to you guys and just holding that shot long enough that the absurdity of it really sunk in, that, that that was life for you. And there was nothing else going on. It was just a long badminton game. Although you guys, it was hard to find a take where you could keep the shuttlecock up in the air long enough. That was the other guys. That wasn't me. I'm really good at badminton. Shuttlecock is the word, right? Isn't that the word? <laughs> yeah, it is. But I think what the problem was, I think <laughs> it was really windy that day, I think was the problem. Maybe we did find one that was great, and, the, and it was the outtakes were very funny. Anyways, that was towards that was episode nine, I think. So episode ten, we shot, and I, oh man, that episode was covered of you know a year and a half's worth of time, which was a risky maneuver that the studio hated, and uh, you know it's always hard to figure out where to leave the characters at the end of the season, and we were we were rethinking that as we went. Um, I was rewriting all the episodes leading up to that and wrote that episode myself. And I mean, it was clear to everybody when at the table read that the high level of quality we had managed coming up to that episode was not being achieved at that table read. And it was a, it was a sickening feeling. And I rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it moving forward and was pretty sure I had the pieces but there was a lot of arguing about where we were leaving people and what the vibe was and whether it was too depressing, whether it made sense, whether it was satisfying. And I really was sure we had all the pieces and that the scenes were, were, were written up to, to finally up to my standards. But in editing, we were moving scenes around. We were juggling that thing as if we were juggling index cards on a board. Wow. And I, I don't know that that's our strongest episode of TV that we made, but I think it holds up. And 
it was crazy because you know the the <coughs> sets were the sets were struck. Everybody had gone home, and we were still like, "What if that scene is the ending?" And what if that? I mean, it was it was pretty wild. It really was. Well, I really thought it was the head of Gabler stuff that that held it all together, but uh, <laughs> and, but what do I know? Is that in the last episode? It was. That was, yeah. <laughs> really, really, really preposterous, and I had so much fun doing that. Um, I, I was in Hedda Gobbler in uh, in college, and my theater professor uh, emailed me to say he'd seen that episode. And he was very excited. Well, it was fun getting to play a bad actor. You know, it was came it came naturally to me. What can I tell you? Yeah. Um, Urge you guys not to be. We were like more, more, less bad. <laughs> less bad. That's but see, I hear that all the time from directors. That's all I ever hear. That that was great. Can you try and make it a little less bad? Um, so uh, I, didn't, I didn't know how to interpret that. Well, the, the better you guys were, actually, the funnier it became. You know, the the more. It was already so preposterous. Yeah. It, the costumes alone were were pretty <laughs> great. Prison, prison head up. Um, you talked about um, the difficulty of, uh, or, or rather, the, the path that a scene can take from the time it's in your head to the time it gets shot. Yeah, after there have been seventy-two chefs sticking their fingers in it. Yeah, it's. Funny, I, I feel overseeing this process and, you know, get shorty. We really we had the luxury of taking an enormous amount of time to get the material ready. You wouldn't know it from me saying that we were still figuring out episode 10, but we really spent a long, long time breaking story long before, you know, the, the production starts setting up to shoot and and. So we take all this time talking about an overview of the characters and who they are and what they want. And then we try to figure out the arc of where they might head over the whole season. And when we've got all that, then we go back to the episodes and start plotting it out in more detail. And then down to focusing on one episode and one storyline and down to the scenes. We've already spent, you know, a month, more than a month now at this point. Now we're into you know, breaking the scenes and the scene work and what the minutia of what's going on with that within that scene. So you outline the scene, you revise the outline a couple times, you write the scene, you revise you revise that a couple times. At each point, it's you have to defend it to against the notes, or you're taking great notes from executives from the studio, da, 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 back to the back to the writers again, all the writers are weighing. It's, it's, it's an insane process where you are stress testing every single moment of that. And by the time you're done, you've had, hopefully, you've had to defend it so much that you've, you've boiled it down to material you believe in, you really believe in. And so I'm always having to reconcile that with putting it in front of actors and a director who are coming to it fresh. And so on some level, they, they have fresh eyes and they're also putting it up on, on its feet, which is a whole new process. And so they are um, justifiably excited about discoveries they make in that moment. They are, uh, and, they, and they believe in very much in what they're feeling in that moment. And they, a lot of times will come to me and say, well, we've come up with some great changes, you know, and, and I have to, I have to both keep an open mind and say, you know, this is a different part of the process. They're coming to it fresh. They may really have um, found a beating heart in this and taken it a different direction than, than than we had, and it may work better than what we thought about. But there's also a part of me that that wants to say, you have no idea how many people. You, you, you've spent, I don't know how long, a, a director maybe is, re, how long have they spent just on that scene? If they've spent a half an hour just on that scene, rereading it, thinking about it, the dramaturgy of it, that would be, that'd be pretty good. I mean, they've spent, you know, they've thought about 
the whole thing and they've, they've read the whole thing and they've thought about casting and they've thought about all these myriad production concerns and angles. But if they've just thought about that character and what they want and what is making this tick for an hour for one scene, that would be pretty good given the amount of time that they have to prep. We've spent a, the, the, the man hours that have gone into that scene. We might have spent 50 hours, 60 hours, 70 hours on that scene. Maybe more, maybe more with everybody trying to find what the strongest through line is. And I'm not always sure that everybody on set is conscious of that. And I have to come in and say, you are very smart, but what you have just thought up in five minutes is not necessarily, if it's really taking a different direction, it's in the big picture of this story that we are telling, this whole episode, this whole season, this whole series, you are not necessarily keeping all that in your mind the way we were in the moments leading up to this. Right. So it's a funny, it's a funny push pull of trying to be respectful and open minded. And, and yet you've got to reconcile that somehow. I remember when I first started doing any uh, directing, um, what an eye opening experience it was for me. Because, you know, as, as an actor, and I think most actors feel this way, uh, my, my, my attitude was always, I am the tip of the spear. You know, I'm telling this story. And when I started directing and looking at sets and costumes and blocking and all this other, the, big, the bigger picture stuff, I started saying to myself, Jesus, you're a really small part of the story. <laughs> You know, there, there's hard, but there's so yeah. There's so many other things going on that are telling the story than you. Yeah, I mean, I was having a debate with somebody about the the, the merits or lack thereof of writing while stoned, and uh, for me, what makes it impossible is you might be able to focus. Just you can block everything else out and live in that in that little moment, but that's that's not the job. The job is living in that moment while still feeling this inc this huge overview, keeping all of this, if not in your conscious mind, basically in the flow of your body. And that is, <laughs> I can't do that, Stone. I would never be able to do that, Stone. Yeah. I, I hear all the time about, you know, all the writers who write where they're drinking. I can't have a sip of bourbon or a glass of wine uh, and write. No, for me, it's coffee and maybe cereal. That's about all I can manage. Yeah, cereal. Uh, talk to me about um, tax rebates. Uh, tax rebates. Would that be a topic that I maybe mentioned to you? I would like to talk you, about. You mentioned it, but I, you know, I know a little bit about what happened. Um, yes, uh, on the surface, <laughs> tax rebates may not be the topic you would think would lead to an exciting story. In fact, we tried to tackle tax rebates in Get Shorty, uh, which was a tough sell, as you might imagine, to the network, but. Tax rebates, uh, you know, when you when you come up with your when you sell a show, you no one no one's really worrying too much yet about how much it's going to cost. I mean, a little bit, but they're not really crawling into that. yet. They're kind of more excited about the dream that you're going to create. Then when the show is ordered, comes this sort of unpleasant reckoning when the studio on one hand and maybe a line producer who hopefully isn't loyal just to the studio on the other side they go off and they look at the script the pilot script and they look at the what you described as the direction you're going to take in the series and they start trying to figure out how much it's going to cost to do all that and then the studio comes back with probably a low ball number and hopefully if you someone in your corner they come back and they educate you on how that number is absolutely impossible. And then you start having a conversation about how to pull this off. And the, we literally had, you know, someone from the studio saying to us, well, you don't need to set up lights 
on some of these locations, you you know, they were basically pitching, you can make a dogma. I mean, that's worked very well for, for some filmmakers. So we had this whole battle of, come on, to really accomplish what we have sold the network, we need a lot of money. We need this much money. So then, as I'm sure all your students know, places you go in the country will give you a rebate. If you bring all this business there, if you bring all this production there, they will give you some money back in various forms. Hopefully, they will just really write you a check and hand it to you. In my experience, when it comes time to get the money back, it never is as beautiful as you'd hoped in terms of what you do. But it does mean you're faced with sometimes some very funny and absurd uh, choices where in our case, we had a whole show about LA. We were beating our chests about how this is a love letter to LA. It's about show business. And by the way, isn't there some benefit in a show that some of it's shot on studio sound stages in LA? I mean, we can we can use those sound, be, it's gonna work out so beautifully. No, they really wanted us to go out of LA and get a rebate. So season one, we ended up going to Albuquerque, right? I think so. And that immediately was problematic for us because we're trying to shoot LA and Hollywood, Hollywood in New Mexico, which was seemed impossible to do. So first we ran into some problems where we couldn't hold, there wasn't enough crew in there for us. So we were flying people, we were flying at one point PAs out from LA in order to just staff up our production. Sure enough, it, just everything we'd worried about started to happen where we were not saving any money. We were having massive overruns. And one of the executives who I love told me, you know, you, you, you got to stop saying I told you so on every, on every call. I was defensively trying to explain the budget. And he said, no one can hear you say I told you. So. It doesn't help us. At one point, we realized that to pull all the people we needed in our going back and forth, we were also shooting in L.A., it was actually cheaper rather than flying everybody on separate commercial flights and, and, and letting them have a whole day off when we got back to L.A. If we could keep shooting and we could corral them all, it would be cheaper. So it was actually cheaper to rent private planes and fill them with PAs and crew members and try and get everybody to keep working. So we had like a private plane or two flying people around and how that is saving anyone money or how that is a, a smart uh, strategic use of funds. I mean, it's obviously not. We finally came up with uh, a device where the characters in the show who are making a movie in the show in order to get a tax rebate in the show had to pull their their period English drama out to Nevada, which so in our case, Albuquerque. So we justified that the show within the show. And and every year as we move every season as we moved forward, we faced this this problem. Season three, we were uh, in Vancouver uh, doing doing LA in Vancouver. I mean it it can be uh, and then you're digitally scrubbing out things and putting palm trees in and some poor prop person has got a palm frond and they're it's blowing in the wind because we're in New Mexico but they're it's in the background it uh use, using it as part of our story and get shorty was uh was at least a meta we we, we at one point we had a uh, wrote a scene where the absurd, we were trying to capture the absurdity of it, and we had a sandstorm whipping up in the Nevada desert, and we had the characters all in in goggles. And then on the day, we were, in fact, in the desert, forced to be in the desert, and sure enough, the sandstorm whipped up, and we had people who weren't even on camera who were wearing these big goggles. We were, we were like, is this, is this pushing reality? I mean, is this straining credulity? Does anyone actually wear goggles in a sandstorm on a set? There they were. They had we were doing it. Wow. Wow. You mentioned uh, the um, digital uh, digital effects. That had a, a big uh, impact on the show? 
I don't know what other shows are doing, but I was struck, and, and I find it interesting, the degree to which we used CG on a show where you would never think, and in scenes where you'd never guess we were using them, and how much flexibility it gives you, and how much money it saved you. Because you know you can save a reshoot by changing scenery, or uh, I'll give you some examples. We got really stuck uh, having uh, problems getting a Canadian child actor to the U.S. to shoot some scenes. And so we did a, all it is is a scene where the baby's being held and moved around, but you see the kid's face. He's very well established at this point. And so we did a face, you know, they, they, they put his face onto a, a different child, which you'd think would be hard and, and certainly not, you would never dream that it was happening in this sort of lo-fi, not flashy, not action scene moment where, where you're hanging out with the kid. It looked great. It looked great. You'd never, you'd never guess. Um, arguments about, you know, we change a scene. I don't like how something's staged. And so we changed some ADR and then we realized at the last minute, oh, but she's got this line about, about why is there no butter? But it doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, someone comes in and CGs, a, she pulls the lid off the butter and now there is butter because somebody mapped out a stick of butter and CG'd it into that moment. There's probably a dozen of those in every episode in uh, extra boxes in the corner in a, in a scene where somebody's moving a piece of furniture that looked so crappy when it came out for some reason, but that we CG'd a whole new dresser there. And when the actor knocks on it, he's knocking on a, a different piece of furniture. You can't see because they've, they've pasted in a new, th it, it's amazing how, uh, how common, it was on our show, and I assume for other people, it's really an interesting. And then you had some crazy stuff where one of your actors got a Broadway show, and you wanted to accommodate them being able to do that, but you still had stuff you needed them for for your show. Yes, so Sarah Stiles, uh, who is a fantastic singer, and I, I, I cast her not even knowing. I sort of learned after the fact that she was this this Broadway uh, actress and singer, you know, Sondheim, she done all this amazing stuff. And so uh, going into season three, I had been long warned that a Broadway production of Tootsie was, was heating up and that she was doing this. It was, I got warned when it was a table read and I felt like, oh, sure, let me know when it goes to Broadway. But it went to Broadway and there was all this uh, Tony buzz around Sarah and I think I could have held her to her contract. It would have been a horrible thing to do, but she really wanted to go play this, this great part. And she, she wanted to still be on the show, but we realized we'd have to really thin out the role. And we came up with the idea of having the character who is a singer on, the, on our show. Once we realized she was a singer, we started giving her singing stuff, work to do. We thought, what if the character auditions for Tootsie and then gets the part? And then maybe we could we could should talk to the producers of, of the Broadway show, and we'll have our character go to New York to watch his wife in the show, and, and we'll come up. We came up with a whole story where that character is feeling like this has come between them that she's off li living this exciting life, and he's been left behind on the West Coast. So the producers of Tootsie liked the idea, and we had this. In, in retrospect, incredibly naive moment where we thought, well, they want to do it. We want to do it. I guess it's that easy. I'm really just, just a shocking naivete from everybody involved. By the time it was too late to back out and we had written this you know, story into the whole season, we started, the reality started to kick in, that there are massive amounts of union rules that we can't just waltz in with a, with a camera and a couple skeleton crew into a Broadway theater, that the lighting designers and the uh, peep costumers and all these folks have union rules that, that prohibit this without a massive negotiation and money. Um, and with all the goodwill in the world from the producers, it's not that simple. 
Right. So we moved. We now, instead of just this easy thing of walking into a theater and shooting it, we, we got a theater back in Vancouver and we matched the theater and the producers, we, you know, they wanted to make sure we didn't get a rinky dink theater and sort of besmirch the, the, the pro production values of their, of their Broadway show. So we got a fancy theater and we started trying to figure out how to mock up the set without ripping off, you know, pay homage to the set without actually copying it. Same thing with the costumes and could we use the routine and we'd have to find an orchestra to record the orchestral music. The composer was okay with us using it, but we couldn't use any of the musicians that had already played it. And, and then we had to have every producer or anyone who's even peripherally involved in the movie of Tootsie sign off on it, including Dustin Hoffman. We had people who hadn't thought about Tootsie for all these years. We had to like, we had lawyers running around hunting them down. I'm not doing this, so I'm, I'm having to pep talk and beg MGM lawyers who really have better things to do than spend all of their time taking on this enormous legal problem. And we had to come up with second and, you know, B and C backup plans and tell Sarah, so Sarah's doing eight shows a week, okay? And we end up flying her on a red eye on her one day, the night before her one day off. She's already, her head spinning from doing this routine over and over and over. She flies in to Vancouver where we have a whole theater with hundreds of extras and, and a cast filling in for her cast that she's never met. And she doesn't know until basically that morning if she's doing the Tootsie number or, or some other number that we've sort of half agreed on. Good Lord. I'm directing this stuff. And, and I'm a uh, first time, second time director at that point. And we, she has this weird experience of going from her, her doing this number and having a dressing room to doing the same number with, all, with just the faces on the stage are different. And then we fly her back. And it, was, um, and it was triumphant, I think. I think it came out wonderfully. Uh, and it was, and she's and having, we could never have faked it because her, that level of talent, uh, this, and she'd been doing this thing, she could do it backwards and forwards and in her sleep uh, to throw her into this scene. It, so she was, it was an actress playing an actress uh, who weirdly in Tootsie is also playing an actress. It was like, for, oh yeah, there's a picture of the green screen. Yeah. Had her doing it against. It was the most meta moment I've experienced in my life. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Well, um, there's one last thing I want to uh, get you to talk about before I let you return to your life and your family and your agonizing over your next project, um, which is um, your, your sense of purpose about what it is that, that we do, that you do as a storyteller. Um, has that evolved for you over the years? Why you do what you do? I, I'm sure it's evolved, but in a weird way, it's almost more. Um, I, I think I, I work harder at retaining uh, the the excitement that I had when I was starting out. Uh, there's, you know, it, it, it's a job what we do, and I think if if you're not careful careful, there's the danger that it becomes a job. And and you forget what's exciting about about what you're doing, and which means you're very likely to uh, be making material that's less exciting. Um, and I don't know, I or or at least it's taking fewer risks. That's 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 less surprising. And so I think if you can hold on to that excitement 
um, that's key. And, 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 and finding what's exciting might change and evolve. And the quest for having something to say is, is never ending. Um, that's, you know, you, you can really feel fulfilled on a project and like you've, you've communicated something that's from the center of who you are. And then on the very next episode, let alone the next project, feel like, what am I doing? I'm just, I'm just owning it in here. I, I'm not connected enough to it. So that's, that's always a, a battle. That's always a quest. And uh, that, that never ends, <laughs> I think. Are there particular themes to which you find yourself returning? Yeah. But I also try to, I, I'm fascinated with memory and with perception, you know, the, the way we all sort of uh, – view the world through a lens that we we grind that we create ourselves um but i try not to get too heady if i get too caught up in themes i start to get removed from human beings and where where i really get the most excited it isn't a theme or an idea necessarily it's it's a a, a human emotion or, or motivation that is surprising to me and yet I recognize on some level. Um, you can derive from that what it means easily enough. I mean, it means a bunch of things usually, but being connected to that character in that moment in a way that you really feel is, uh, isn't an idea. That's, that's just this source of of inspiration that you go looking for. But I guess what I'm also curious about is not so much, uh, and I don't mean saying to yourself, oh, here's here's a theme or an idea that I want to write about. Uh, as a, a, Instead, I guess what I'm curious about is if you find yourself writing these stories that appeal to you, and then do you step back and say, oh, wow, Yet again, I'm because I notice in my writing, I, I'll have an idea of a story I want to tell, and if I line up almost everything I I write, I can I find I look at it and I say, oh wow, you're telling that same not the same story again, but you're struggling with that same idea, you're struggling with that same issue. Yeah, I, I mean it can be more overt than that. Uh you know, uh, sometimes I'm pulling from a bag of, I have a, I have a friend who calls it big bag of trick. Uh, right. You're recycling ideas that hopefully can withstand looking at again and again from different angles <laughs> um, or with a somewhat different context. Uh, for sure, I do that right down to pulling from previous, I, I pull somebody right out of my last thing and put them in the, in the new one, just cause I love that character. And I, I want them in this, in this world now. Um, that, that's, that's even more overt. Than, but that's not a subtle dynamic for me. <laughs> that's a, a very clear one. Right. Well, uh, I guess the last question I'll have is, you know, for my, my students at the university, wh what do you think people should do who want to do what you do? I mean, the it's the crazy. I mean, it's the question that that it has as many answers as people who've who've broken in somehow. For me, I, you know, it was just about like I say, I wrote so much terrible stuff. I think I wrote more terrible stuff than most people will need to actually write break in, in in most cases that I had, I had a particular hang up, like I say, which was a disregard for story and, and in a fascination with rhythm, which came into play when I when I finally put all the pieces together. Some of the qualities I was attracted to, I think, are, are very important in what I now do. But but there was just an enormous amount of doing it while I was bartending. And, and, and I think that at the end of the day, 
you want to come out of it with the work, the work to show you need that script or that film or whatever it is. You need you need to have a thing that people can see because the world is so hungry for that. And that that is more important than any other aspect of it is is Paul is is getting your craft up to speed. In my case, I you know was bartending until I until I broke in. But um, I know folks who, you know, I, I have a, had a writer's assistant who's now a, a writer going out with a, a show that I'm a producer on, but it'll be his show. Uh, and that happened pretty quick. He went from, wow. And, and he, he went the route of being an assistant. And by the time he got his break, he knew everything about show business and the business itself. And he knew he'd made connections and all this stuff. I was the opposite. I didn't know anything. It took me 10 years as a working writer to even start to put together what studios are working with who and all that stuff. So for me, it's about the material first. That's great. Final question. Tough one. Where did you bartend? A bunch of places, but New York City, my, my best bartending job was at a bar, uh, at a at a noodle restaurant called Republic in Union Square. Ah, yeah. And uh, it was, man, I I made I made a lot of carrot juice and 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 cosmopolitans. I was on the Upper West Side at a place called Coastal. That was uh, Upper West Side. Got it. Upper Did you bart <laughs> bartended Coastal, and then it turned into Josie's. That was. That was my time behind the bar. I, I did a couple nights at an Upper East Side place. Can't remember R Rupert's. Something oh. like. That. And I, I on my first shift, a giant cockroach ran up the wall next to a customer, and I whacked it with the menu, squashed it. That I only had that job for a night or two. Yeah, that'll do it. Well, listen, Davey, thank you so much uh, for doing this and sharing your your history, your stories. This has just been great. Um, I wanna... great, great to see you. It was really fun rewatching uh, your Clive Bernhardt. Was that his, his name? Your Clive uh, Clive Bernhardt. Yeah, I think Bernhardt. Watching uh, what you did on Get Shorty was really fun. I watched a bunch of it today. Yeah, silly Great. stuff. But thank you. Um, this Wednesday evening, uh, let the viewers know that on the this other show that I do with my brothers, the Arkin Brothers Talk About Movies, we're going to be talking about my favorite year, and Mark Lynn Baker will be joining us to talk about that. And next Monday on this show, my guest will be the, the wonderful Dana Delaney. Um, so, uh, say yes. hello. I will say, I will say hi for you. Uh, we're going to talk about our time together on dinner with friends and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so, and, uh, subscribe to us if you want notifications of what's coming up. And again, Davey, thank you so, so much for, uh, for jumping in on this. It's just been great to have you. So great to see you and I'm, I'm honored. Thanks. Man. Talk to you soon.